Hello comic fans, here's Earl Grey with three crime books and more or less all in a pulpy vein. One book is in my opinion pretty good, one excellent and one rather forgettable. Starting with the good book, Lady Killer, written and drawn by Joel Jones, the first half written by Jamie S. Rich, colors throughout by Laura Allred. The 10 issues of the series are collected in one of these library editions by Dark Horse. To my knowledge, there hasn't been a bad library edition from Dark Horse yet, and this book is no exception. Binding, paper, everything is very nice and top-notch, including the ribbon. I bought Volume 1 of the Neil Gaiman library even more recently, and boy, that's a beautiful book as well especially for the relatively low price point of the library editions. As to Lady Killer, the general premise is actually given away in the title. It's a 180 turn of the old Lady Killer trope. So it's not a man having his way with the ladies, but a lady literally killing for money and sustaining a pretty bourgeois little family and lifestyle. The conflict between her existence as a loving wife and mother on the one hand and as a reckless and ruthless killer on the other hand generates enough friction to propel the story forward and to deliver the reader with plenty of violence and black humor. The art of Joel Jones is perfect for this kind of story. Especially her Josie is a so well-drawn character, elegant and sexy in one panel, caring and seemingly decent in her role as a housewife in the next panel, and ruthless and violent in the panel after. It's such a visual treat that you almost buy the actually pretty implausible story. Add the supporting cast of characters from the unsuspecting husband, the mother-in-law, and Josie's partners in crime, it's a surprisingly light-hearted, well-rounded story with pulpy vibes. It's really entertaining and enjoyable. But yeah, the characters are not really believable, not to say many are mere stereotypes, well-worn clichés. Even if they are twisted in a way like with our title-giving anti-heroine, and the plot is in many parts too obviously constructed, to have a bigger impact on me. A lot feels as an excuse to have some irreverent fun with senseless violence, and to be honest I definitely had a lot of fun reading this book, but I think it's a good thing that it's not called Lady Killer Volume 1, because this one volume is good for what it is, and a sequel would probably, if not inevitably, disappoint expectations, I guess. Lady Killer is set in a very specific time frame, the early 60s, and it's very well done, including fashion interior designs of that time and some Tupperware party. But it almost feels like pure decoration in comparison how poignant and precise Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips use historic background for the short graphic novel Pulp. It contains only 65 pages of story, if I haven't miscounted, but it feels really satisfying, almost epic. The story takes place in the late 30s, but harkens back to the late 19th century, so it covers a lot of ground with the change from the America of the Wild West days to the kind of modern USA in the late days of the Great Depression. The main character, Max Winter, is a man about 60 years old, so he has lived in more ways than one through these dramatic changes of the American society. He now tries to survive by writing pulp novels about the Wild West days, hence the title. But despite of the title, this book feels the least pulpy of the three. At least if you associate pulp with cheap entertainment, narratives that excite just for the sake of excitement with cliché-driven plots. Pulp from Brubaker and Phillips is of course not free from clichés, but they are cleverly used in the overall plot that it still feels right and real. Even more so, it's full of historic atmosphere and makes you think about the times back then and, what's maybe even more important, our times today. 
Jean Philip's art is simply great as ever. He's probably my favorite of all of these artists that work in a photoreferential manner. And the colors of his son Jacob grow on me with each of their cooperations. There's some sublime coloring to be found in this book, even though the coloring of the flashback parts is maybe a bit harsh and could have been made a bit more subtle. But that's probably just me and hardly a valid point of critique. So overall, Pulp is an excellent, excellent read, straight up one of my favorites for 2020 already. Which unfortunately can't be said about Captain Swing and the Electrical Pirates of Cindery Island. I got this little hardcover because of two reasons. It was sold for half cover price or so. And first and foremost, it's written by Warren Ellis. And Ellis delivers some interesting stuff about the history of the London police, aka the Bobbies, and uh, some other fiction. Even though he does it in inserted pages with prose only, in some ugly or at least not matching huge font. The actual story is drawn by one Raulo Caceres. It's about steampunk pirates hovering over the London sky, some kind of Victorian Robin Hood and his gang who is chased by the more corrupt faction of the London police. That's basically the story, and I wonder if Ellis' script is longer than some sentences written on a napkin. Despite the actual somehow cool rough idea, the plot is pretty forgettable. The art could have been at least interesting though, if the colors from Digicore would have not drowned everything in dark tones. Even for Avatar, this coloring sets a new low. They advertise the art for this comic as a woodcut style. But hey, Avatar, good woodcuts are not only about the dark parts, but it's important to have enough lighter parts to have enough contrast. Anyhow, as I said it, this book was cheap and the story can be read in one hour, so the damage was not too big especially as long as there are fantastic reads like Pulp out there to balance it out. Thanks for listening and watching. Goodbye.